To most people, Screaming Lord Sutch was best known for the outrageous politics of the monster-raving loony party, but he was also one of Britain's true rock originals, whose eccentric personality disguised an inner turmoil that ended when he took his own life. Born David Such, he committed suicide in the early hours of June 15, 1999, at the age of 58. Over 40 years had passed since he was discovered, aged 17, at the Two Ice Coffee Bar in Soho. His succession of bands introduced some of rock's finest, including Richie Blackmore, Nicky Hopkins and Keith Moon, and his innovative performances predated and inspired heavy metal, punk, even gothic rock. When she walks down the street, he's never far behind. His little black bag and his one black mind. Will he really catch his up when the lights go down? Cause that's the time he starts his dirty uh, shop around. A superb showman and publicist, he was ahead of his time with his over-the-top and scandalous performances. You don't think you're active then, Sim? No, anyway. I'm only out to give visual entertainment, something that a lot of singers nowadays don't. They just walk up to the microphone with a guitar, open and shut their mouth like a goldfish, and nothing happens. I like to put on a show as I'm doing a record. Don't just sing it, but to act it. In 1960, national service had ended, and so had the first flush of rock and roll, which was replaced by anemic coffee bar rockers. Carla Little had just finished his stint of national service and remembers his first meeting with Dave Such. This weird-looking guy came through the cafe door. Hair slicked back like tars and grease, looked quite long. And he had a pair of goggles, motorbike goggles, but there was no glass in them. Look at that weird guy, and he's strange. We had a lot in common because of the music, the rock and roll. They were to be collaborators in a succession of great bands, although in the beginning, Such was just an interested spectator. We were rehearsing one night, and I said to the guitar player, look, why don't you do a sort of screaming solo? You know, just go for it, you know, really give us an attitude and have a go. We're all new to the business. And in the solo, he went, woo, like that. Everyone went, wow, and Dave Such, who was just sort of there, hanging around at the time, went, wow, and he threw his head forward in excitement, and it all came down, his hair, about 18 inches long, and he was going mad, you know, with his head and all that, and we all rolled up. I said, Dave, I said, this is incredible, you've got, you've got to be the singer. He said, I'm going to call myself Screamy Lord Such. I said, OK, I said, let's think of a good name for the band. He said, it's wild and it's savage. I said, yes, it, the savages. Screamy Lord Such and the savages. And so that's how it was born. At the start of the 60s, the Two Ice Coffee Bar in Soho's Old Compton Street was still the place to go for those seeking rock and roll fame. Screaming Lord Such, with his very long hair and loud clothes, stood apart from the DAs and winkle pickers of the other hopefuls when he went for an audition with the manager, Tom Littlewood. I run the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, which is fairly well known because Tommy Steele and Cliff Richards and Adam Faith and other people started there, you see. And one afternoon, a strange individual came in and presented himself as Mr. Such. So he asked if he could do an audition. <laughs> For his Two Eyes audition, Dave Such was determined to pull out all the stops. Now, I was very much amazed uh, when I arrived looking like a rag and bone man. He had with him a large bundle of miscellaneous equipment, the sheepskins, a pair of buffalo horns, a man trap, a pair of snowshoes, and so forth. <laughs> Come 
come along with me, Jenny Jane. Oh, Jenny Jane. Hey, that little pony. Oh, I see a real rock, Jenny Jane. Well, Benny, Benny, Benny. Benny like a pin and drop, Benny, Benny. Oh, Benny, Benny. Such shocked the audience with his outrageous audition. No one had ever seen anything like it on the British rock scene. Tom Littlewood immediately signed him to his package tours with other regulars Vince Taylor and young recording star Jackie Linton. We're walking down the street and he had the hair. It wasn't the garb really, it was just the bunny. And people would come towards us and they would cross the road. They wouldn't walk past you because seeing him, seeing the first man, well, they didn't know he was a rock and roll, they didn't know he it didn't matter, he had this, a man having hair down at his shoulders. It's not in six inches away for any, anybody, it's ridiculous. Once on the road, Such began to really evolve his act, stealing the glitz of the wrestling ring and musical, and taking ideas from another Two Eyes original, Wee Willie Harris, he created the first rock and roll show band. Every song, we had to think of a, a prop to go with that song. For instance, blue suede shoes, he'd find an old junk shop and find a, a pair of army boots, size 14 or something, and paint them gloss blue. Then he saw a, a toilet seat in a, in a junk shop and said, that'd be good round my head. How about that? Mm. Right. Have a look in the mirror. They were often running with a new kind of act that can only be described as rock and horror. Such also began to discover important musicians. That first band included guitarist Bernie Watson and classically trained Nicky Hopkins, who later recorded with the Stones and the Beatles, and set the standard for a succession of savages, most of which had drummer Carlo Little forcing the beat. Well, wherever we played, there would be ten guitar players watching the guitarist, ten drummers watching me, ten watching him, and the rest watching such. A young Paul Dean, who was later to find fame as actor Paul Nicholas, played piano in one of the early Savages bands. What was wonderful for an audience, you know, who'd only been used to really either seeing the, the, the so-called semi-pop stars of the day or dancing to bands like Cliff Richard and the Shadows, um, they had something really interesting and fun and slightly terrifying to watch, so it was fantastic from that point of view. Uh, and it was great for me to be in it because we all felt like stars. We weren't used to people gathering around the front and, you know, really looking at us. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now like to introduce you for the fifth time to the one and only Screaming Lord Such! We do this thing called the Minge Pole. Have you heard about the Minge Pole? <laughs> he suddenly say, Ah! The Minge Pole! And we go, No! Not the Minge Pole! <laughs> If you're in show business, you must really believe in it and you must really feel it. Otherwise, the, the public themselves can tell. And everyone in the audience will get very frightened. You take this pole. Wonderful stuff. Chaz Hodges, later of Chaz and Dave, was backing Jerry Lee Lewis, who toured with Screaming Lord Such. Now, I've never known Jerry Lee Lewis come out of his dressing room to watch an act at the side of the stage. The only act he's ever done that to was Screaming Lord Such. You just see the humour, see the fun, see the rock and roll. And Jerry Lee Lewis, as far as I know, has never ever done that. I mean, he was, they were, he was the biggest thing on the halls around Britain. He'd come on and do the, the real show-stopping stuff, which was, of course, Jack the Ripper. 
Um, and Jack the Ripper really consisted of Dave dressing himself as Jack the Ripper and painting his face completely white with perhaps a little touch of sort of deep rouge lipstick. And we'd be all on stage going, the Ripper, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> They love it. They come to see horror. They pay five or six shillings to see me, the same as they go and see a horror film. They're looking forward all week to being frightened. Hey, Mary. Ah! We watch all the latest horror films, anything connected with horror, and we put our ideas to these and then put music to them, and there we have a, a sort of Victorian stage show. <laughs> So he'd stick the knife in, doop, and the guitar player went, <laughs> Then he'd take another incision, doop. <laughs> then he'd sort of pull the chest apart, stick his hand in. The Jack the Ripper act, full of blood and gore, would often encourage the local Herberts to invade the stage looking for a fight. The band always made sure they knew the quick way out. They really took exception to this whole act and they rushed the stage. And this was one time when my escape route came in very useful because I did a runner out the stage door. In fact, we all ended up outside the stage door. And I was halfway down the road with Dave and he was in a telephone box. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm phoning the press. I said, Dave, they're coming down the road. He said, coward. Once such was arrested after the audience set upon him when he fired a gun at them as part of the act. Carlo, as always, followed him to the local Nick. As I was talking to Dave, but I couldn't see him, and he was round the corner, I was fiddling in my pocket with this starting pistol, and it had a hair trigger, and it went bang! in my pocket and I went, oh Christ, and all smoke was coming out and all the police came rushing at me from the cells and all God knows everywhere and it was going like this, I was going, what, what, what? So I was smoking that, you could hear Dave laughing, is that you, is that my gun going off and all that sort of thing? Phone George, when you leave here, phone George, whatever you do, this guy George who got him the publicity in the first place. From then on, every gig was solidly packed. He was bums on seats. If you booked him, and Tom Little would know that, and uh, uh, knew this, it, it would sell out, no matter what, because he knew about publicity. He knew about bums on seats. Dave Such did, and he knew that. He knew he knew that. The, the more I muck about and have little romances and uh, have little giggles and, and um, shock people and get bad publicity, the more popular I become with the kids. Get along. Playing to packed audiences, it was only natural that he would sign a record deal. It fell to the weird and wonderful producer Joe Meek, who had had hits with the Tornadoes and John Layton, to try and capture the excitement of Suchy's live act on disc. Together they made a series of rock horror classics, Jack the Ripper, Dracula's Daughter, until the following night, written by Lord Such. And the moon is shining bright In the centre of the graveyard In the middle of the night I get out of my grid I pick a long black heart Until the fall I mean, his records were too wild for a record, really. I mean, if you listen to his records, they're just too wild. But, uh, I mean, talk about punk. Um, I suppose it could be classed as early punk as well, you see. Joe Meek was one of the many gay men who felt at ease with the early music scene. Such was a natural partner for Meek's imagination, if not his advances. 
he was always asking members of my band to stay over to do a bit of overdubbing. Uh, but they said, oh, I'm not going up there again on my own, you know. But it was always, I noticed, I was very naive. I, I, it was never the ugly ones in the band, you know. It was never the ugly sax player. Such is records, though jukebox favourites were only cult hits. His early 60s singles are genuinely energetic and fun, with performances that rank among the few out-and-out -out raunchy rock and roll records waxed in Britain before the ascension of the Beatles. His stage show went from strength to strength, earning prodigious amounts of money and giving him a good living. It was amazing the money he got, uh, considering you know that he never had a hit record. Some people think uh, I'm just a complete nutcase. Some people uh, says, well, it's entertainment. They've got a sense of humour. They see the funny side of it. And, and other people think I'm very shrewd in what I do. I started off with nothing, and I've ended up with a nice big car and a nice big house and a few shillings in the bank. At first, mother didn't quite understand, but, but now um, I bought a nice house and, and, and different odds and ends. Um, um, we live very, very comfortable now where we used to live in just a couple of rooms. I think she's very, very pleased that I've gone on the way I have got on. Because um, everybody was against me at first, uh, really including my mother. Uh, sometimes she wanted if she had a, a son or a daughter, you know. Ready, Dave? Hi, this is Lord Such and the Savages on Radio London. When pirate radio offered an alternative to the boring record programs of the BBC, Such was shrewd enough to realise that there was money and publicity to be made. He set up his own station on an old fort in the Thames estuary, repelling all borders. Radio City started life last May as Radio Such. Pop singer Screaming Lord Such sold out for 5,000. Present owners say they're trying to shake off the Such image. This is Radio City, your swinging tower of power. Such loved attention and realised that politics afforded considerable publicity. His lordship headed into fringe politics with a policy of votes at 18 and legalising pirate radio. His teenage party was the forerunner of the loony politics which would keep him in the spotlight for years. Screaming Lord Such implores the people's votes. Screaming Lord Such demands that he to Parliament be sent forth with to speak for pop, teenage and coffee bars. Alas, Lord Such, squares here or cats prevail. Last, last, most irreclaimably all gone is thy deposit down elections drain. Another line of show business, Screaming Lord Such is actively working in Charing Cross Road. He's flying high, our Lord Such. His opponent at Highton Lancashire, none other than Mr. Wilson. It sounds a bit of a long shot, and here in the West End, some people don't think he's a dog's chance. The law has no views either way. Well, I went to Highton to stand against Howard Wilson in the uh, general election and to get as much publicity as I could for my National Teenage Party. And, uh, well, as you see, we got some in one of these papers. I was with him when he stood against Harold Wilson in Highton. <laughs> and I remember running round uh, giving out leaflets for our screaming lord in the leopard skin. And um, Such had a great photograph done of him trying to shake hands with Harold Wilson. He, he released that as a Christmas card. He thought that was very funny. I did a, a short um, meeting with Harold Wilson. But it was wonderful how he managed to keep himself in the public eye. He was a brilliant master at that. By the end of the 60s, the pop world had caught up with him. Long hair was now normal and everyone wore weird clothes. But he'd been ahead of the game for 10 years and uncovered numerous future stars. Musicians that were uh, anything had gone through his band some time or the other. Um, he sort of like took them on board just after they left school, really, sort of, and uh, turned them into wild men and let them loose on the world. And they all became famous, had more money than Dave Such. 
Guitarist Richie Blackmore found fame with Deep Purple. Nicky Hopkins was working with The Beatles. Keith Moon was let loose with The Who. And Matthew Fisher had a worldwide hit with A Whiter Shade of Pale. I think he was a very important person in, in the British rock and roll movement. I think he caused an awful lot of things to happen and gave an awful lot of people a start. I mean, he put the wildness into it. You know, it was all very pretty, pretty before such. And they go, I mean, Richie Blackmore wouldn't have been Richie Blackmore but for such. The heavy metal sound he'd created with the Savages was taking over, especially in the USA. Dave Such invaded the new world in a painted roller with a trailer and passed himself off as a real English lord. Gathering up favours from old friends like Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck and members of Jimi Hendrix's band, he recorded his Such and Heavy Friends album, which gave him a hit in the States and became a cult favourite. Returning to England in 1973, he appeared with all his rock and roll heroes at Wembley. Billy Fury, Little Richard, Bill Haley, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry. But it was Such, with his flair for publicity, who made the news headlines in the TV stations. Mm. and she got her, her front out and, uh, of course, that sort of stole the show. Oh, 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 oh. He dyed his hair green. I said, what the hell are you doing dyeing your hair green? He said, well, rock and roll's evergreen, so... Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. Such continued performing to packed houses not just in England but abroad as well. Over 20 years, the teenage party involved into the monster raving loony party. People like you, you're ruining this country, you! <laughs> no, I say in all seriousness, do I love a joke? <laughs> Such was becoming likeable. Old ladies loved him. He was no longer dangerous. <laughs> In 1991, he appeared on BBC's Record Breakers for having contested the most elections. A political party is just for you. Move yourself, get on your feet to the party tonight in Downing Street. Everywhere. We've even got a party song, so everybody sing along. Over the years, Dave Such had lived with a succession of girlfriends and even had a son. But on the loony campaign trail, he met the girl who became his partner for the final years, Yvonne Elwood. He had a certain eccentricity, but he was just happiest, really, either going out with the dog or... He used to like to feed the ducks. He'd sit for hours by, by a pond feeding the ducks, um, drinking tea, that was his big thing. He would drink probably 30 cups of tea a day. Um, he was quite happy to just spend hours drinking tea, watching television, reading the papers, going round charity shops and car boot sales. That was his big love. This is the most famous number one fan. Yes, I've fallen in love with this monster. So really, he was really quite, quite ordinary, really. 
For all his outrageous antics, Dave Such's lively public life disguised a very private depression, kept secret even from his closest friends. Why you just wouldn't go where this guy has been. It did seem to come in waves, so he'd have good weeks, good days, interspersed with, with bad weeks and bad days. It was a depression that overwhelmed him when his beloved mother died a year before his own untimely death. He never really got over his mother's death, you know, it had hit him very hard. Despite this depression, he continued to perform. Um, abroad, it was um, a much younger audience that were coming, and they were they were always sold out all the all the gigs that he did. In the last year, he had he done Germany and the Isle of Man and um, Italy in the February before his death, and of course the big one that he was really looking forward to was um, Las Vegas, and that was going to be a Halloween festival. Um, and that was going to be in the October, of course, in America, and uh, never made it. We were going to combine it with, with getting married out there. Depression appeared far from his mind when he took to the stage for the last time with Carlo Little and his all-star band. Just five days later, Yvonne was confident enough to leave him to clear out his mother's house. I went in the afternoon and I uh, opened the door, you know, I had a key open the door, and I could see him at the top of the stairs, and it looked as though... At first I didn't realise what, what he was doing and it looked as though he was standing at the top of the stairs and it looked almost as though he had makeup on because he was so so pale. I said, oh, David, what, what are you doing? And, and he didn't answer. And it was only as I got you know, to the end of them that I, I could see that he, that he was dead, that he was hanging. Today, flowers have been laid outside the home where David Sutt was found hanged, apparently the victim of suicide. I was devastated, the same as everybody else was. Just couldn't believe, not of Dave, because I didn't know there was anything wrong. He made his living from publicity. He would have loved to have seen himself on all the front pages. It's tragic, isn't it? Everybody had that feeling that the coffin lid was going to open up and Dave was going to come out and sort of jump over and say he'd ever been had or something like that. When the shade of night is falling And the moon is shining bright In the center of the graveyard In the middle of the night I get out of my grave I pick a long black coffin Till the fall of the night 